Good morning. Good morning. Does anybody have a poem with them? You don't? Nobody carries a poem? You know, I memorize them. I've got a couple memorized. Yeah. How long? <laughs> Pretty short. Come up and read it. Say it. It's an uh, un untitled poem by E.E. E. Cummings. Uh, may my heart always be open to little birds who are the secrets of living. Whatever they sing, it's better than to know. And if men should not hear them, men are old. May my mind stroll about strong and thirsty and fearless and supple. And even if it's Sunday, May I be wrong, for whenever men are right, they are not young. And may I do nothing so usefully, and love you so much more than truly. There's never been quite such a fool who could fail, pulling all the sky over him with just one smile. Nothing I will say will exemplify the witness of poetry as beautifully or effectively as that poem, not learned by rote memory, but spoken from the heart, remembered by heart. So let me explain my title, and I, I'm not sure I have much time to do much else, but let me, let me try. Uh, the witness of poetry, and, and I'll, refer, I'll be, re, I'll be uh, uh, um, drawing upon the previous talk, um, which, the beautiful talk, um, not least of all, um, the, the, the line, to attend to the much aligned, much maligned world of appearances. And that's simply my thesis that what we need to do, first and foremost, is attend to the much aligned, much maligned world of appearances. And we have to reflect why that world has been maligned. Do we? I will be drawing upon American philosophers for a reason. They are important. French philosophy is crucial. One is philosophically illiterate if one does not know French philosophy. German philosophy is critical. One is philosophically illiterate if one does not know German philosophy. But my map of Europe includes more than two countries. Vico and Croce are important. Unamuno and Ortega are important and Peirce, James, and Dewey are important, especially for Americans. They should be read in conjunction. One should have in one's mind the image of Henri Bergson and William James, a deep, intimate friendship. Their letters sing off the page. What? So let's, let's go back now. Uh, and let me, let me quote James. The line is that if you have a trans-experiential absolute that will de-realize in a stroke the entire world of appearances, the opposite of appearance is not reality, as Dewey said, it's disappearance. There's, we think about appearance and reality, time and eternity. We think about any number of dichotomies. Night of philosophy is now over. <laughs> no, it ain't, sister. It ain't, it ain't over to the skinny guy sings. 
so, so we think about, if you think about those that are invidious distinctions, because appearance does not carry the same value as reality. Time does not carry the same value as eternity. Finitude does not carry the same value as infinity. But there's something remarkable, and here's a small bit, a small fragment of intellectual history. There's something quite remarkable that happens in this, the second half of the, of the 19th century and the opening decades of the 20th. It's not confined to philosophy. 1859, the origin of species. All of a sudden, something important happens. Impressionism, theory of special relativity, quantum theory. Substance exits, process, and relationships enter in a way they had never entered Western consciousness. Time and history enter Western consciousness in a way they have never entered before. The unconscious enters Western consciousness in a way into a depth it's never before. So what, what we have, it seems to me, is a radical shift in, 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 in the arts. In my title, the, the Witness of Poetry, but I, I'm, I'm using poetry precisely in the sense you, to which you refer. The original Greek sense, which is a synonym for making. It's, it's the, the act or process or practices of making. And it, it's crafting something finely. And, and it, um, there's, a, there's a quote I rather like. It's from a memoirist by the name of Patricia Ham Hample. She writes, we do not, after all, simply have experience. We are entrusted with it. We must do something, make something of it. A story, I'm continuing the quote, a story we sense is the only possible habitation for the burden of our witnessing. I want to quarrel with her. As important as narrative is, it's not the only possible habitation for our, the burden in, of our witnessing. And it's not merely the burden. It's the delight of our witnessing. It's often the burden. But it's not merely the burden. And it, it could be a dance. It could be a drawing, it could be a painting, it could be a sculpture, but an experience lays claim to us in a way that demands an articulation. Now, whether it be an articulation in the form of narration or something else, seems to me dependent upon circumstance, individual talent, and any number of contingent factors. I do want to reflect, but I also want to read. I wish I could, I wish I could recite some of these from, from memory, but I cannot. And I, wa um, I, I, want, to, I want to read from two African-American poets. One, a contemporary African-American poet who lives in Brooklyn, and he's a good friend. And it's, it's, a, it's a brief poem called City Pastoral. The poet's name is Billy Joe Harris, and it's about attention, being called in the morning to attention. Garbage trucks groaning, garbage cans banging, car, alarm, car alarms sounding off, noisy, pushy birds waking me at dawn with their smart ass song. A poem by an African-American uh, woman who recently died. And now this poem is, is a little difficult to get, but I, uh, so it, it's, it's basically written in the pattern of call and response. And, and, and it's not so much call and response as 
position opposition, where the voice of authority is quoted, and then the voice of the rebellious poet inserts itself. And so she starts with the word, she starts with- May I have your attention, please? May I have your attention, please? Naya philosophy will end 15 minutes. I repeat that Naya philosophy will end in 15 minutes. Thank you. He's, they, they seem to continue to be deluded. It's not over until it's over. Okay, so, so, so it begins with the word autism. Colon, from Webster's New Universal Dictionary and Random House Encyclopedia. Autism, quotation. In, psycho in psychology, a state of mind characterized by daydreaming end of quotation, and the, that the poet inserts herself. And every time I say, say rather, there is the poet speaking back to the voice of authority. Say rather, I imagine myself in the place before language imprisoned itself in words. Quote, by failure to use language normally, the voice of authority, the voice of the poet. Say rather that labels and names rearrange themselves into description so that what I saw I wanted to say. By quotation, by hallucination and ritualistic and repetitive patterns, voice of authority, right? Say rather, circling and circling my mind, I am sure I imagine children without small rooms filled with holes. All men penned, imagine actual humans howling with animal fear. Voice of authority, again giving the definition of autism. By failure to relate to others, end of quotation, poet. Say rather, they began to recede, to run backward, as it were, into a world of words. Apartheid, hunger, war, I could not follow. Voice of authority. By disregard of reality, with withdrawing into a private world. Say rather, I withdrew to seek within myself some small reassurance that tragedy, while vast, was bearable. Say rather, I withdrew to seek within myself some small reassurance that tragedy, while vast, was bearable. It seems to me if there's a thread running through most of the talks these last 12 hours, it's just that. Yes, <laughs> tragedy, it seems relentless, and it seems vast, and it seems unbearable, but it ain't. And we, we have the capacity to endure. And so, um, what, I, what I'd like then to do um, is, is end with two poems, both of them by the same individual, William Stafford. And, how, and this, I think, adds to what um, Clifton is saying. The poem is entitled, Allegiances. It is time for all the heroes to go home, if they have any. Time for all of us, common ones, to locate ourselves by the real things we live by. Far to the north 
or indeed in any direction. Strange mountains and creatures have always lurked. Elves, goblins, trolls, spiders. We encounter them in dread and wonder. But once we have tasted streams, touched the gold, found some limit beyond the waterfall, a season changes and we come back changed. But quiet, safe, grateful. Suppose an insane wind pulls all the hills while strange beliefs whine at the traveler's ears. We ordinary beings can cling to the earth and love where we are, sturdy for common things. You hearing this, be ready. Starting here, what do you want to remember? Not quite yet. How sunlight creeps along a shining floor, what scent of old wood hovers, what softened sound from outside fills the air. Will you, will you ever bring a better gift for the world than the breathing respect that you carry wherever you go right now. Are you waiting for time to show you some better thought? When you turn around, starting here, lift this new glimpse that you have found. Carry into evening, carry into day, all that you want from this time. This interval you spent hearing or reading this, keep it for life. What can anyone give you greater than now, starting here, right in this room, when you turn around? Thank you.